morning everybody, good morning, it's JPR and welcome back to another video. So, mythical Pokemon, they're a bit of a strange bunch, they are rare to an extreme degree in a similar fashion to legendary Pokemon, which has caused a lot of confusion for many people about what exactly defines a mythical Pokemon. In Japan, mythical Pokemon were always considered a separate group from legendary Pokemon, but in non-Japanese media, the line between legendary Pokemon and mythical Pokemon wasn't distinguished until Generation 5 began, so they effectively had to undo about 13 years worth of international confusion. So if you didn't know that these are two separate categories up until now, don't worry, I don't blame you in the slightest. But I did promise at the end of my How Rare is Every Legendary Pokemon video that I would do a video on mythicals in a similar fashion. You know, only three months later. You guys know how I am with time. I don't even script, record, edit, or upload these videos in the morning. And the first thing I always say at the beginning of these things is, Good morning, everybody, good morning. So I think this says a lot about my time management skills. So here we are. I figured I would just clear up any and all confusion regarding the line between legendary and mythical here at the beginning. Now, for those of you who watched that video on legendary Pokemon, you may remember this one unique line. Now, I said events are questionable, but distributions are certainly not up for debate. There is nothing canon about the delivery man in the Pokemon Center handing you shiny versions of these ancient deities. Sorry. So, that is gonna have to hold up for Mythicals too, which presents a bit of a bigger challenge here, considering most Mythicals since Gen 5 have just been delivered to you in a Pokemon Center from a mysterious benefactor. And I know, that's gonna be a hot topic among the comments section, but I literally already made a video about this problem of why it's stupid and dumb, so don't think I'm ignoring it here. So for this video, I will have to gather any and all evidence from the games, anime, and manga to determine how rare every mythical Pokemon is. The only thing that's off the table here is the events where a random mailman just gives you the Pokemon. If you catch it during the event though, it's fair game. With all that out of the way, let's get started. The most common. All right, let's get the easy ones out of the way. Meltan. I mean, their whole gimmick is that you need to get a lot of them. Like, hundreds. Though, Melmetal is a little bit more ambiguous. The Sword Pokedex entry for Melmetal reads that, at the end of its lifespan, Melmetal will rust and fall apart. The small shards left behind will eventually be reborn as Meltan. And obviously, those Meltan will eventually be able to recombine and form another Melmetal. So the question is, is this the same Melmetal reincarnated, or do we consider this an entirely new being? Melmetal's Pokedex entry in Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee seems to push us towards the former, reading, Revered long ago for its capacity to create iron from nothing, for some reason it has come back to life after 3,000 years, indicating Melmetal as a singular being. Though, I wouldn't read too much into this, as the Pokedex commonly refers to many Pokemon as singular creatures who are actually quite numerous in nature, as we saw in the Legendary Pokemon video. Plus, you can quite literally create multiple Melmetal in Pokemon Go and transfer them to the main series. Not to imply that Pokemon Go is the most reliable source of canon information, but if you ask me, it's entirely possible that multiple Melmetal could exist in the same time period. I would say, at the end of the day, Melmetal is likely not too rare by mythical standards, it just happened to be extinct for a long, long time, causing most people in the Pokemon world to forget about its existence altogether. Next up is Shaman. Now, in the core series games, we only ever see the one Shaman we catch at the Flower Paradise, though Professor Oak does briefly mention that a stone tablet similar to the one that appears at the end of Route 224 was recently discovered in Kanto. Although we never get to see the second stone tablet, this could imply that a second Shaman has appeared to bless the people of Kanto with feelings of gratitude. Yes, be grateful that your region has had two remakes now. Please go away. I also find it just a bit conspicuous that so many people randomly have Gracidia flowers in almost every region and know exactly how they work with Shaman. To me, this at least implies that a Shaman must come through the area every once in a while. But for the hardcore evidence, look no further than the end of the 11th Pokemon movie, Giratina and the Sky Warrior where a whole horde of Shaman appears and soon later flies off. This ending was later repeated in the Diamond and Pearl series, where the Shaman Marley had been caring for was able to meet up with its friends, and the same thing later happened for Mallow Shaman at the end of the Sun and Moon series. Even in Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Explorers of Sky, we can see several Shaman living in the Shaman Village, so across multiple forms of media, large groups of Shaman living and traveling together has been a common theme. Also occupying this category is Celebi. Most of the evidence placing Celebi here comes from the Pokemon anime, where Celebi has appeared many times. 
times. In fact, it's appeared so many times, I bet Ash Ketchum doesn't even think it's mythical anymore. It appears in the fourth movie, the thirteenth movie, the brand new twenty-third movie, the Battle Frontier, the Sun and Moon series, Chronicles, and two of them appeared at the same time in Pokemon Journeys. There is no shortage of Celebi in the anime, and from what I can tell, these are all different ones. Even if you were to remove all of Celebi's subsequent anime appearances, the iconic revival scene from the end of Pokemon Forever alone shows the existence of many different Celebi. In the core series, there's not a ton to go off of except for this mysterious Pokedex entry from Fire Red and Leaf Green. When a Celebi disappears deep in the forest, it is said to leave behind an egg it brought from the future. I mean, if he's Masuda Methoding, then that would explain the odd abundance of shiny Celebi across the franchise. While we may not know for sure, the fact that it's at least implied that Celebi is capable of reproduction is better than we're going to get for most of these mythical Pokémon. The majority of these Pokémon are so mysterious that we basically have to draw our own conclusions based off of minimal information. And lastly, Fione, if you count it as a mythical Pokémon, because truthfully, nobody really knows if it is or not, not even the Pokémon Company or Game Freak themselves. But yeah, if Fione is to be considered a mythical, then using a Ditto, you can just breathe endless amounts of it in-game. That's all there is to it. Fairly common. Leading us off in the fairly common tier is Diancie. Diancie's whole deal is that it's basically a long-term mutation of Carbink, and this is a pretty well-known fact throughout the Pokemon world, so obviously a few must have popped up over time and will continue to pop up in the future. But unlike Shaman or Celebi, Diancie is clearly coming into existence at a much slower rate. In the universes of the anime and manga, there's only one Diancie we know of, though in the 17th movie, it's at least implied that there were multiple Diancie around in the past to sustain the life force of the Heart Diamond. Up next, Deoxys. Deoxys has been seen in four different instances throughout the anime, including its own movie where two Deoxys notably were present at the same time. Excluding events, in the core games there is only one Deoxys that we are familiar with, that being the one that appears at the end of the Delta episode in Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, which actually makes Deoxys one of the only mythical Pokemon that is catchable without an event. Other than that though, there's not much evidence of other Deoxys existing. But going back to the anime for a minute, it's a bit hard to believe that Deoxys is exceedingly rare if five of these things have shown up on or near Earth at some point. Do you know how big space is? They don't call it space for nothing. Even if there were only two Deoxys, I would still consider that an incredibly large number, considering they probably come from someplace ludicrously far away. So if five of them have crashed or come even somewhat close to Earth, I have to believe that there are hundreds, perhaps even thousands of these things elsewhere in the universe. Plus, Deoxys isn't described as a Pokemon, rather it's described by the Pokedex as a virus. Do you know what viruses do? I feel like I shouldn't have to explain those given certain circumstances, but, you know, they multiply. Anyway, just because he's mythical on Earth doesn't mean he couldn't be some other planet's equivalent to a Pidgey. Right up next is Genesect. Now, for Genesect, discounting events, we don't have any solid evidence from the core games to work with. But in the movie, there were five of these bad boys revived by Team Plasma. And even in the Adventures manga, it was shown that Team Plasma had access to multiple Genesect. Now, normally, this would qualify him to be moved up a tier in the few of a kind category, but he also has that same Deoxys syndrome going against him. You're telling me that Team Plasma was able to dig up and resurrect all the Genesects who ever lived 300 million years ago? Yeah, I didn't think so. Odds are, this Pokemon was actually quite numerous during the peak of its existence, even if we have nothing but a hypothesis to work with. And lastly, Zarude. We still don't know much about it, but we do know that there will be quite a few of them appearing in the 23rd movie, Secrets of the Jungle. Even in Sword and Shield, there is a distinctly different Zarude that will eventually be given away after the normal one is. Given how new Zarude is, this Pokemon could possibly be moved down to the common tier in the future, but for now, this seems like a fair placement. Few of a kind. This next tier is comprised of Pokemon that we know there are multiple of, but in a very limited capacity. First up is Manaphy. The only way to obtain Manaphy outside of gifted events is through the Manaphy eggs from Pokemon Ranger. Yes, you heard that right. Eggs. We know for a fact that all three Ranger games take place at different points in the same timeline, and all three Manaphy egg events are completely different. Normally I hesitate to use spin-offs as evidence, but this is literally the intended method for most trainers to get Manaphy. Plus, they quite literally say they need a trainer from Sinnoh to look after the eggs, so it's not like it's super out there like most other spin-off games. Additionally, before the player even hatches the Manaphy egg in Sinnoh, they can go to Mr. Backlot's mansion and find a photo of Manaphy in one of his books, meaning a fourth Manaphy is out there somewhere. Yes, this was definitely done just so players without Ranger could complete their Sinnoh Pokedex, but hey, evidence is evidence no matter what form we find it in. The next Pokemon is the one that comes directly after Manaphy in the Pokedex, Darkrai. With Darkrai, we can strictly use evidence from the Pokemon anime. 
The first Darkrai obviously appears in the movie Rise of Darkrai, which is later confirmed to be canon in the episode Sleepless in Pre-Battle, where a second, more malicious Darkrai appears causing nightmares for the residents of Canalave City. Then, of course, there's Tobias' Darkrai. Now, whether this is a completely different Darkrai or the same Darkrai from Canalave City is up in the air, but regardless, it won't impact its placement on the list. We know there are two to three Darkrai minimum roaming the Pokémon world, perhaps even more that just keep to the shadows. Rounding out this relatively small tier is Magearna. Now, Magearna is a very strange case of a Pokémon. Not only is it an artificial Pokémon, but the Pokédex reiterates multiple times that Magearna's body is merely a vessel. Instead, the actual essence of its life is contained within the Soul Heart. I don't know, maybe you could build multiple Magearna? Maybe you couldn't? I haven't watched Full Metal Alchemist in a while, I forget how creating an artificial soul works. The wording for original color Magearna in the Pokedex is so strange too, I can't make heads or tails of whether or not it's the same Magearna in a different body or a different Magearna altogether. Plus, when we actually got original color Magearna in Sword and Shield, it didn't come with any supplemental information whatsoever. So, my only real evidence comes from the Pokemon anime. Sadly, we can't use the Magearna movie as evidence since it's non-canon, and the lore of Magearna in that movie doesn't quite match up with the lore presented in the games. Dang it, Pokemon movies, you were doing such a good job up until this point in providing canon evidence, and you just threw it all away here. But later in the Sun and Moon anime, we see that Mon purchased a shiny Magearna, highly inferred to be a replica of the original for Lily when she was a baby. Even if we haven't seen the original Magearn in the anime, I find it pretty unlikely that only the shiny version would exist here. Though, I don't know, Magearn's different forms, including both its shinies, could easily just be different coats of paint. Regardless, I think there's just enough evidence combined with the fact that it's an artificial Pokemon that could be replicated at some point that there's gotta be a few roaming around. It kinda falls into the same category as Type Null from the Legendary video. Possibly one of a kind. In the next to last tier, we have Pokémon that are inferred to be one of a kind, or just ones with inconclusive evidence that point one way or the other. The ancestor of all Pokémon, Mew, falls into the latter category. Like many other mythicals, the main series games present very little information to work with here, since it's mostly only ever been given away as a gift, leaving us with only the singular Mew on Faraway Island and Pokémon Emerald to work with. Even the Pokédex adds basically nothing of substance to our investigation. In the canon of the Adventures manga, it's also strongly implied that the only Mew is the one that lives on Faraway Island, though the manga in general is much better about mythical and legendary Pokémon always being one of a kind. However, there is a reason why Mew exists in this tier and isn't solidly in the one-of-a-kind tier, as the anime complicates this a bit. It's commonly thought that the Mew that appeared in the first movie and the Mew that appeared in the Lucario movie are two distinctively different Mew. Both of these movies are also canon with the core series, so we can't use that excuse as an easy way out. However, Ash and Pikachu's memories were wiped at the end of the first movie, so it makes complete sense why they wouldn't recognize Mew in the eighth movie. It also makes sense why Mew wouldn't react to them at all, considering Mew only saw Ash and Pikachu in the first movie for a matter of minutes, and most of its attention was on battling Mewtwo instead. They do have remarkably different personalities though, especially in the Japanese versions where the Mew in the first movie was almost as antagonistic as Mewtwo was. But hey, maybe he just had a sudden shift in mood in the time between these movies. Normally the discussion would just end there, but yet another wrench has been thrown into this with the Mew from the Pokemon Journey series that Go aims to catch one day. Is this a different Mew? Will they ever even get the chance to interact with it? I guess we'll have to wait and see. Some people will probably bring up how in the lore of the anime and manga, Mewtwo is always born from a fossil of Mew, meaning that there had to have been different Mew that existed in the past from the current day one. What most people forget though is that Mew's genetic data was obtained from a fossilized eyelash, not its entire body, meaning that eyelash easily could have come from the present day Mew. But the most confusing part of all is Mew's status as the ancestor of all Pokemon. How did Mew begin this lengthy family tree? Were there incredibly large numbers of Mew in the past that bred and developed multiple different species of Pokemon and they eventually died out, leaving just the current day one? Or did one Mew successfully reproduce on its own somehow, and that's the same Mew we know today? Surprisingly, this is a question that has never been explored in any capacity. Next is Keldeo. I thought this would be a much easier one to place until I remembered that I can't use either of the Uno events as solid evidence since the game just gives it to you. There are NPCs who mention the existence of Keldeo and Unova even outside of the event, so I thought that when Keldeo showed up in the Gala region's Crown Tundra, it was a done deal. That Pokemon had to go in the few of a kind tier. Then I read the Pokedex entries. 
Many of them reference that Keldeo is a world traveler, which means that I can't just assume that the one that trained in Unova is different from the one that appears in Galar. I know in the legendary video we did confirm the existence of multiple groups of Cobalion, Verizion, and Terrakion, but there's definitely a reason why Keldeo would be the outlier who's classified as a mythical. Maybe he is the only one. Either way, I can't really say with certainty. Okay, so all getting lumped together here are Meloetta, Hoopa, Volcanion, Marshadow, and Zaraora, because clearly the Pokemon Company did not care about these guys at all. If I had any substantial information whatsoever, I would give it to you guys, but I don't, because they don't want me to have it. Their movies don't explain anything, the games don't explain anything, Meloetta doesn't even have a movie, Hoopa and Volcanion never show up in the main anime, Marshado and Zeraora do, but their movies take place in different universes. And plus, the Zeraora that we do see in the anime wasn't even in Ash's universe, it was a different Alola altogether. So you know what? I'm throwing in the towel here, because I don't know anything about these guys. You don't know anything about these guys. Game Freak probably doesn't know anything about these guys. They just happen to be the incredibly unlucky ones who came out in the era where mythical Pokemon got treated like crap. I know, I promised I wasn't gonna rant about that again since I already did in another video, but I had to get out of my system. The point is, I literally can't tell you anything about their rarity because there's just nothing out there for these five. Moving on. One of a kind. Kicking us off for the final category is Jirachi. Now, this one is quite remarkable because excluding events, there are zero Jirachis present in the core series games. Heck, there are zero references to Jirachi by name in the core series, though some have speculated that the useless white rock in front of the Moss Deep Space Center may in fact be a slumbering Jirachi. So purely from a game's perspective, Jirachi is easily the most rare of all mythical Pokemon. And unlike Marshadow and Zaraora, who are relatively new Pokemon, Jirachi's been around for almost 20 years now. And yet in all that time, I could not find any solid evidence that points to Jirachi being anything more than one of a kind. Now, I did get to thinking, what if there are multiple Jirachi, but none of them have awakened during recorded history? Now, sure, in the anime, Jirachi only appears during the approach of the Millennium Comet, but the Pokedex has repeatedly stated that the singing of a pure voice can wake Jirachi once every thousand years. So if there are multiple Jirachi, I can't just believe that they're all on the exact same sleep schedule. At least a few of them should have awakened by now. Going purely off this tidbit of information, I have to say that Jirachi is more than likely a one-of-a-kind Pokemon. The sole strike against Jirachi comes from the Pokemon anime, where it awakens during the sixth movie under the care of Max, and another one is later encountered by Ash in the Best Wishes series. But there is a problem with this incident, of course. That being, this Jirachi awakens for basically no reason. Ash does recognize this Jirachi, which implies that the sixth movie is canon, but there's no comet, there's no singing voice, this Jirachi just wakes up. I don't usually discount stuff from the main anime, but this goes so hard against all the pre-established Jirachi lore. It makes literally no sense and feels more like a mistake on the writer's part than actual evidence. Especially since in literally every other form of Pokemon media, Jirachi is described as a one-of-a-kind Pokemon. Next is Victini. Oh, thank goodness, this one will actually be quick. Victini appears once in the games, once in the anime, and once in the manga. That's it! Thank you, Victini! That's all I wanted to see! You made my job so much easier! Though, most of the viable credit goes to Victini's in-game event in Pokemon Black and White, where it's highly implied that Victini is a one-of-a-kind Pokemon that's been living out its days on Liberty Island. They even drop a tidbit of information that the creator of the Unova Pokedex purposely labeled Victini as Pokemon number zero, hoping that it would only be used by the person who held that Pokedex in order to obtain victory. It doesn't make a ton of sense, but I'll buy it. And finally, what more fitting way to end this video off than with the Pokemon God itself, Arceus. It is described as the sole creator of the universe. Basically, every piece of Pokemon media points to Arceus being the one and only. In fact, one of its many aliases in Sinnoh mythology is the original one, which in my opinion not only describes it as the first being in the universe, but also the only of its kind. Not counting the scrapped Azor Flute event, there are zero wild Arceus that can be obtained in-game. Arceus only appears once in the manga, and though it's in two different Pokemon movies, its cameo appearance in Hoopa and the Clash of Ages doesn't add or take away from its status. It doesn't really add anything to that movie either, if I'm being honest. And it has never made an episodic appearance in the anime. And with that, we have successfully determined the rarity of every single mythical Pokemon. If you made it this far into the video, please subscribe to the channel. I think it's safe to say that you'll like what you're gonna see. This took a lot of work and even more research, so any and all support on this video is greatly appreciated. Thank you for watching, have a happy new year, and I'll see you guys next time.